you very much for that. Uh, I've also got two colleagues, Phil Holcastle and Steve Staffel, in the background in case you have any technical difficulties as well. The session, as you've heard, will be recorded. And if you want to participate in the session, then above the chat pane with the list of participants, you'll see that we will be asking you a poll shortly. And there'll be a little drop down menu there. And you'll either have a yes, no, or a multiple choice question. Um, if you want to raise, if you want to have ask a question, you can raise your hand and then somebody will respond at various points to questions that gather, um, either via the chat pane or you might want to contribute. If you do via microphone, then we can uh, hand the microphone over to you. Um, Steve will help if you're having problems with the sound, but the session is being recorded. So without further ado, let's get started. So the aims of this session are, I'm just going to turn the video off now, actually, so that it's less distracting for all of you and also for me as well. So the uh, aims of the session are to understand what is meant by flipped learning, be aware of some of the advantages of flipped learning and some of the tools that you can use to produce flipped learning resources and see a few examples of those, um, and to be aware of how the technology can actually support effective delivery and engagement with learners. And also, we'll be hearing from, as we've heard, Jake, uh, who's a learning provider uh, from a teaching and learning perspective. And also, we'll be hearing how flipped learning has been used to support CPD in one instance as well. So first of all, we'll start off with a poll then. So if you could answer this question, please, by clicking on the drop down menu option. What's your level of experience with flipped learning so far? You're not really sure what it's all about. You've never tried or used it. Had a little dabble. Or do you use it regularly? So if you could actually use the drop down menu above the list of participants, that would be helpful for collating rather than just typing in the chat pane. OK, we've got quite a few responses there. So let's have a look at the results of that. Oh, thank you, Steve. So we've got uh, some of you have never tried or used it. A few don't really know what it's all about. Thank you, Steve. Uh, a couple of you have dabbled a little and no really regular users. So it's sort of in its infancy, really, and it's uh, something to maybe be aware of. OK, so we'll just clarify a little bit about what we mean by flipped learning. It's about turning the traditional classroom model on its head. So that means, looking at this image from an infographic, which you'll find all of these resources in the files that I've transferred to you. And we will be referring to some of them, but we're not looking at all of them in the, in the time that we have available. But if you want to, Steve's put the link for the infographic in the chat pane. So a traditional classroom might be teacher at the front of the class delivering knowledge and content, um, and the learners then going away and doing homework and possibly struggling uh, with some of the activities that have been set. In the flipped classroom, that roles are reversed, and you will see that you've got uh, teachers engaging with the learners and maximizing their use of contact time. And the active learning goes on in the classroom while the, te the students prepare beforehand by watching materials that the learners, are, that the tutor, sorry, has put on their VLE possibly and shared with them, multimedia resources. So they might watch a video, for instance, um, or go through a series of learning objects and then come to the lesson prepared to do active learning. At this point, it's, I know not all of our uh, listeners here today are from the FE and skills sector, and we've got some from HE sector as well. But I'd just like to mention um, that many of you will have been already inspected with the new Ofsted Common Inspection Framework, uh, some of you still to be inspected. And you'll notice that there has been a new emphasis on technology specifically mentioned in the inspector's handbook. And if you want to move towards a grade one, then you really need to be thinking about these three particular areas. 
how is technology being used to support learning outside the classroom? Inspectors will be looking for this. So how do you use your VLE? Is it just a repository for resources, or is there active engagement with uh, the resources? So flip learning might be um, an opportunity here. Secondly, they'll be looking for effective use of technology within the classroom and resources as well. That might be use of smart boards, maybe use of learners' own devices to get them engaged with the learning process. And thirdly, they'll be used looking for effective use of technology um, in assessment. So do you have electronic uploading of assignments, marking online, giving electronic feedback, all these sorts of things. So it's worth thinking about those things as we bear uh, flipped learning in mind and some of the benefits. So it might well help you to get from a grade two to a grade one. So, Jake, you've had a little go uh, with creating some flipped learning resources and perhaps you could outline some of the, the benefits that you've seen sure. and tried them with your learners. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the first one is uh, flexible access. Uh, so the students can use these flipped learning resources um, in so many different ways, really. They could use them at home. If they've got a smartphone, they can even use them on the bus. Um, so they're not restricted to times when you're actually available to support them. So I know at the moment with exams coming up, I've had a lot of students coming to me uh, wanting extra support around exam time. And I've obviously only got so much time. But by preparing these resources, the students can access them at a time that suits them. Um, so in that way, the learning is obviously um, a lot more personalized. So some students might want to watch a particular resource four or five times because it's something that they're really uh, struggling with or that they find difficult. Other students might watch it once, yeah, I've got that straight away, and move on to something else. Um, this stronger student-teacher relationship, I think, is also interesting because if we um, are delivering a lot of the most basic material outside of the classroom, so the students have already watched some kind of presentation, we freed up time within the classroom to do more one-to-one -one work, to do more group work, to um, develop more like a coaching relationship with the students. And that can really strengthen our relationship with them. Um, we can also share these resources with other colleagues. So again, I know um, in my department there might be various areas of the syllabus that I'm particularly strong on, others perhaps weaker on, and other colleagues could, um, you know, to plug those points where I'm a bit weaker or I could share things where I'm a bit stronger. So we can uh, share resources in those ways. Um, and then this, uh, this next bullet point really I think is the key part of the philosophy behind flipped learning, that the classroom time is used for higher order thinking, for tackling problems, um, for things that really stretch them. And that's what students need the one-to-one -one support of a teacher to help them through. So if they've got the basic information from a presentation before, there's more time in the class for that kind of thing. Um, and finally, I guess something that has been implied in what I've said so far, that this supports differentiation, that students at different levels can use these resources in different ways. Uh, the, the resources themselves can be um, differentiated, but also in terms of how often they use them, um, how much they need to use them and the students can work in a way that suits them. All right, thank you, Jake. Uh, we've got a question in the box there. What's the difference between flipped learning and blended learning? Um, well, flipped learning is making um, the knowledge and the content available online using multimedia resources. And it is part of a blended learning approach, but it's about shifting the, the active learning into the, into the classroom and doing a lot more of that. So th there are lots of overlaps there, Philip, between flipped learning and blended learning. Um, there are some issues, though, with the flipped learning delivery model. So is it suitable for all our learners? Um, have all our learners got the skills um, and the motivation to actually do that work outside of the classroom? Maybe they don't already do a lot of um, homework um, and work outside of the classroom. So there needs to be a bit of a culture shift, I think, um, and the setting of learner expectations if you're going to adopt this model, both pre-enrollment for a course to make it clear to learners that there is an expectation that they will access resources prior to coming to uh, sessions so that they can then engage fully um, in the, the class contact time. Um, there's also issues of 
equality of inequality of access. Have your learners all got access to the internet? Um, maybe they can make use of private study time within your organization, or maybe they can go to local libraries to access the resources where you, wherever you're hosting them um, by your VLE or blog or, or however you're sharing the resources with them. Um, quality of video and producing the vid videos, being aware of the uh, suitable length of time for people to watch these resources, being aware that if everybody on a course team all flipped their learning, that learners would spend an awful lot of time at home uh, watching video, um, and that could be quite passive activity. So the quality, and when you're planning your learning resources that you do put online, to try and just as you would in a traditional uh, classroom delivery model, use a strategy to um, engage the learners so it's not just passive watching of videos. And we'll look at some examples where um, you've got tools to make that happen. And the other thing is that some staff might be uh, a bit video averse and not want to um, share, their, share their face on screen. Well, maybe try audio first then um, rather than video. <coughs> so that's a bit of a workaround there. Just trying to thank you. All right, um, I'll just put this in at this point here as well. Um, Edgar Dale's cone of experience, just from the pedagogical side. Probably all familiar with this that um, you get improved retention as you go further down this scale here in terms of the activities that learners are engaged in. So the flipped classroom helps with this model as well because all of these sorts of activities, which are, tend to be more passive, the reading, the listening, the viewing images, and watching videos, maybe. In the flipped mo learning model, that goes on outside of the classroom. And then when they come into the classroom, they're going to be doing more participating, collaborating, um, and designing, and evaluating, and developing these higher order thinking skills, and hopefully improving their retention as well, and their ability to put uh, what they've learned into practice. So I'd like to hand over to Jake at this point, and he's going to share with us a little bit of his experience of what he's done, and then we're going to look at um, some of his uh, resources that he's produced and used with his learners. So Jake, could you start by telling us a little bit about um, what, what you actually did? Yeah. And why, why you decided to have that approach? Great, yeah. I mean, I'm really at the beginning of this. Uh, I just went on the, um, uh, the course by JSC just a few months ago, and I was inspired by that course and thought I could use it uh, initially uh, for some extra revision for the students. So that's how I've begun uh, with philosophy and religious studies students at ASNA2 level. Um, and yeah, just beginning to explore it and get, get the students involved, really. OK, what about some of the, um, the tools that you've used to create your resources and any kit, special kit that you need? Is it very complicated? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you can use different things depending on your skill level or how much you want to, um, to be involved with it. So I began by using a, school, a tool called Screencast-O-Matic, which basically takes um, a, a screenshot of everything that you're doing on screen. So that's a, a very simple and easy way to, say, create a, a narrated PowerPoint. Having done that, it occurred to me that sometimes PowerPoints, when you turn them into videos, aren't the most engaging videos. So I thought I'd use Prezi. So many people might have used the uh, Prezi presentations. And then things move a bit more quickly with Prezi. And I think that's, for me, that seemed to suit the video um, style a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but then these things can sometimes uh, get a little bit more complicated. So because I was using Prezi and the screen moves more quickly, I wanted slightly higher screencast uh, software. So then I, I had a look at Camtasia, okay. um, which allow, captures at um, a greater frames per second rate. Um, but they're basically they're different things you can use. And I think you can just use something that's helpful um, and then you know, see if you need to develop it from there. And all you're using really was um, a headset to do your recording. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I just sort of plugged the, a microphone in. Um, and again, there are different levels at which you can you can do that. Um, I think I heard that USB microphones will give you a higher quality. But um, the bit of advice I was given, which was so helpful, was to invest in ourselves as opposed to the technology. Because it's quite easy to to get involved in thinking I need to get loads of expensive software, expensive equipment. Whereas if we just start to do it, 
um, and then get the students involved um, and work from there really. Okay, thank you. What were some of the um, challenges that you've experienced with this? Well, I think the biggest challenge is somehow to begin to re-educate the students on what they expect. Um, so I had to, I mean as we often do with students, don't we, have to sort of remind them again and again to do something. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I, that I tried was those of them that had um, access to the internet on their phones was to encourage them to actually look at the blog or look at the resources in the class on the phone to begin with. So right. that, was, that was reminding of that, then sending them emails with links to the resources. Um, but that was certainly one of them, that the students aren't used to that way of learning. So some kind yeah. of you know, encouragement for them was important. Okay. And what about um, some of the, the lessons that you've learned? I know you're at quite an early stage with trialing the, this approach. Yeah. But. Well, I would say one thing that's, that's been really important for me is to have quite, um, be quite disciplined about the amount of time I would spend on making a resource. Because if this is really going to be something that we use from week to week, um, we can't spend hours and hours and hours pre preparing each resource. So sometimes I would think, yeah, okay, what can I do in half an hour? Can I create something in half an hour that the students could use? Um, that seems to be uh, something that was, that was really helpful. Um, and just getting informal feedback from the students about, about what they appreciated and what they didn't appreciate. Um, and I think something that moves a little bit more quickly, this is what the students are used to on YouTube and videos and things, um, than, um, than I might have been used to by just narrating a PowerPoint. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, has anybody got any questions that they'd like to ask Jake at this point before we have a look at his resources? Well, I'm going to do a, a web tour anyway and just show you uh, where these resources are. I think Steve has already put a link in the chat pane. Um, and we're going to, this is um, Jake's blog. And we're going to actually watch this on YouTube. And the one that you've suggested that I use, sorry, my mouse keeps disappearing, was, was this one here, sorry. The repressive desublimation. Bit of a mouthful there. <laughs> um, but there we go. We'll have a look at that one. Right, I'm just going to stop that there um, because obviously we haven't got time to watch everything but we've got a couple of questions there Jake. Obviously you used Prezi for that one um, and did a screencast um, with Prezi um, and somebody was asking did you put any interactions within there? Yeah, um, that, that's something I've done using um, something called TED-Ed. That was one where it, it allows you to actually put a quiz uh, alongside the video, something else I, um, I learned. I haven't done that that often. I, I have done that once, and that's very useful. So it makes the students more active in relation to the material rather than just watching it. They've got um, a short uh, series of questions that they can answer and get instant feedback. Okay, thank you. Uh, and somebody else says, has it resulted in you giving out less homework, or is the homework done more and supported within the classroom context now? Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, it would be too too new for me to say that. Um, okay. yeah, I think the theory, if, if I develop it more, was that the homework wouldn't necessarily be less or more, but it would be different. So the okay. homework would be that they would go and look at these resources, perhaps answer a few kind of more basic questions about those, but then some of the more challenging tasks that we usually think of as homework would be happening in the class. Okay, uh, thank you. And I did say TED-Ed, that's right, uh, Belinda. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we're going to actually look at an example with Ted Ed in a moment. Um, so, I'd just like to ask a question now, um, and we just need to have the poll reset. Sorry, so um, no, we don't use a poll for that. Sorry, in the chat vein, are you already doing some clip delivery? And if you are, which sort of tools are you using? 
because we're going to share a few with you in a moment. But are there any tools that you're using? Some of you are trying flipped delivery. If you could type your answers in the chat pane. Um, Camtasia has been mentioned. Okay, you're using forums on Moodle. Ginny. The VLE and YouTube, yes, obviously. Camtasia. Ah, David's using something on the iPad, an app called Explain Everything. Yes, that's a good one. We'll be talking about iPad apps later. The VLE and Camtasia. OK, thank you. Well, we'll move on again. Camtasia seems to be a popular one. So if you're ready to dip your toe into uh, flipped learning, you don't have to start with reinventing the wheel. There's already a lot of resources out there that you can tap into. So some of you may be away, aware of VideoJug, for instance, which is great for uh, vocational videos like you know, in construction or plumbing or electrical work. For instance, I, I had to change the grill element on my cooker recently and I just went to VideoJug, found a, a three minute video clip and that did the job for me and I felt that I was fully qualified to be able to tackle that on my own cooker and save myself a lot of money. YouTube, obviously, you can find video clips there. TED-Ed, I'm going to show you an example in a moment of what TED-Ed allows you to do, but it basically allows you to take a YouTube video clip, trim it, and then put some interactions around it so that learners aren't just watching video passively, but they actually have to think about it and process it and do something with what they've watched afterwards. Um, David Andrews from Grantham College mentioned using um, some apps on an iPad for creating um, flipped learning resources. He used Explain Everything. Um, another one is EduCreations, which also works on um, Android, where it allows you to take pictures and images and then annotate and record your voice as well while you're explaining things on screen. Uh, and Khan Academy is another one. If you are going to start from scratch though and you want to create your own resources, you might want to start with something simple, maybe producing a simple um, practical video for a training technique um, to show people how to do something. If you're from a business support side, um, there's lots of systems that staff have to become familiar with, like how to marquee registers, um, how to use um, things like ProMonitor, for instance, how to access all the data about their courses. And instead of having big manuals or lots of printed how-to guides, then um, screencasting or recording your screen could be very useful. And we'll have a look at an example um, using some screencasting tools in a moment. Um, or simply narrating over your PowerPoints and putting those up can offer so much more than just a basic PowerPoint with, with no audio on it as well. So here's an example from TED-Ed, and if somebody could paste that uh, link into the chat pane, and I'll put it onto my screen as well, and we'll do a bit of a web tour here. So what this allows you to do is um, take a YouTube video clip, which I've done here, which is one on resonance. Sorry, I seem to have a lot of clicking going on in my... I don't know what's causing that. Um, so what the learners do is they watch the video, and then you've got the option to set some questions on that. Um, so for instance, having watched the video, you ask them a question about, about the video that they've just watched, and they can save their answer, and then you can ask them another question, and then they can progress through to the next section where you can explore things a little more deeply, add links to other resources, and look at things in different contexts, and then finally uh, move on and give them something to think about prior to coming to um, the class. So that's a very simple thing that you can do uh, with YouTube. And you don't have to um, flip your own video you can actually use ones that have already been flipped by other people. So worth going on to TED-Ed and having a little look at that when you get a chance. It creates 
uh, a more interactive experience than just watching a video. Um, next example. Uh, we talked about screencasting, which is how um, Jake started. Um, and he used something called Screencast-O-Matic. There are a number of free um, screencasting tools. Um, these top two, Screencast-O-Matic and Screener, are web-based tools. And also, then you've got some software tools that were mentioned, Camtasia, CamStudio, which is a free version of that, Jing, Wink, and Audacity, if you just want to do um, audio. But all the others will allow you to do screen recording, screen capturing, screen capture. So we'll have a look at one or two examples of those. So I've um, got a screenshot here of um, Screener. We're not going to have time for looking at all of these examples, but they are in the links that have been posted and shared with you. And they will be on our resources after the session. Links are in the files that have been transferred to you, Ginny. So here we've got a screencast of um, how to use grade Gradebook in Moodle. And um, you can see that you can actually embed that into your VLE, or you can share a link uh, with your learners. And you also get um, some tracking as well to see um, how many views that's had. Very simple to use. Screencast-O-Matic is another one, um, takes things to a slightly more sophisticated level. You see here that the pointer, um, you can have a circle around your pointer, so you can actually point to things um, on the screen as you're moving through and recording your screen. Um, this was how to, a quick screencast I did for somebody to show them how to upload a Joram package into um, a Blackboard course. Um, you can actually have video on Screencast-O-Matic as well if you want to, or you can just have um, narration. So they're two very simple tools if you want to get started um, on recording your screen. It can be used for anything that you have on your screen. So as I mentioned, it could be looking at training on software packages that you have in your organization as well. Um, if you want to create narrated resources, again, there's a range of tools. And um, Jake mentioned one called BrainShark. We'll see some examples of that in a moment. Um, and there are some others there. Articulate, which is a commercial product, and Storyline, which is uh, a later version from um, that same supplier. Uh, Present Me, which is web-based, and something that you've probably, a lot of you have heard of, which is um, Xerti. 30 online toolkits, which um, have got accessibility features built in as well. So we're going to look at one or two of those examples now. So um, could we post the, the brain shark um, example, please, into the chat pane? What brain shark allows you to do is to, and I'll put it into my screen share area as well here. Just give me a moment. Trying to multitask here. Right, sharing it with you now. Okay. So what BrainShark allows you to do is to upload any document, not just a PowerPoint, but you could be uh, a Word document or a PDF. And then you can edit um, and put audio on each of the slides. You can share and embed that as well. And you can get tracking and see how many people have watched it. So I've had 51 views, for instance, of this particular one. Um, I'm just going to start it up and show you some of the interactivity on it. So people can navigate to an appropriate slide. I'm going to turn the off recording off for a moment. And you can also um, put polling slides in at different points. So you can ask people to respond. And you can see the views on your account and the responses. So, that's, so you can get a bit of interaction in there. This is also a nice tool for um, if you're setting an assignment and you want to give extra explanation so that learners don't keep coming to you and say, can you just tell me about 
what you mean by this again and that again. So you can actually save time by putting a narrated assignment with lots of comments about what you're expecting um, onto your VLE. So it can save a lot of time and make the learners become more independent as well. So that's uh, BrainShark and that was quite a nice simple one to use. Another one is PresentMe, again, web-based and free. Um, in this example, a screenshot of this example, you can have on the uh, right or left-hand side of the screen, you can have video if you wish, but you don't have to. And then you can have your narrated PowerPoint slides on the other side of the screen. We use this one, actually, um, for accessibility because we had a colleague here, Gordon, who was uh, doing some signing um, as I was narrating the slides. So we thought that was quite a good use of PresentMe. Again, web-based and very simple to use. Um, Xerti online toolkits. I'm going to share this one with you. Again, this is free. Um, you can have your own installation of that. But I'd like to put the link to the example in the window and share that with you now. And I think it's also in the chat pane. Here it comes here. Yeah. So this, uh, these resources, again, you can build in lots of interactivity, um, lots of different sorts of things. You can put YouTube videos into there, for instance. You can have drag and drop activities. You can have multiple choice questions and formative assessment. Um, a range of interactions. So it's not just like watching a video. We've got the navigation there and you can move through the different slides. So this is just a text and image based slide. But you can actually have little slide shows in there so people can move through. And you've got some hot spots on your image. You can have other little bits of hot spots. So it's, it's more interactive than just watching a video. Just moving through quite quickly here to give you an idea of what it's like. And this is HTML5 based. So this will actually work um, on smartphones and um, tablet devices as well now. And this is a, a free resource. And the link to how to download it and more resources about how to get started with Xerti will be available afterwards. I'd like to share with you now um, a bit about how you can use the flipped delivery model for staff CPD. So for those of you who are managers, you may be faced with um, budget restraints. You've got maybe multiple sites, lots of staff that you have to get through mandatory training. Um, and this is one way by doing flipped CPD resources and hosting them on your VLE that you can save staff time in terms of traveling. Um, you can reduce travel costs, reduce pressure on room utilization and booking and having to lay on refreshments. It's actually sustainable as well. And it's, it's been shown in the example that I'm going to show you that it has it actually increased the uptake of mandatory training. And it can provide tracking as well. And staff seem to like it. So I'm going to um, show you now. First of all, um, this is Harry Wheatcroft from Loughborough College, who was the health and safety manager there. And he um, was tasked with producing some mandatory health and safety training online. And I'm just going to post his resource in the web tour so you can see it. And it's going into the chat pane as well. And you'll see that down the side, this was produced using Articulate, which is a commercial package. I'm going to turn the sound off now. But you can see you've got navigation um, down the side here. You've got interactivity built in as well. You, but you can set this up so that you have to progress through the previous slides before you can do the interactive slides. Um, at the end, when you've completed the quiz and got a satisfactory score, um, you get a certificate. And um, also, this is then sent to 
HR and staff development so that it can all be tracked how, people, how many people have actually completed the training. So you might like to look at that afterwards, but I'd like you to listen to Harry, who isn't actually with us live today, but um, I'm going to share the video of him t talking about how much it's actually improved efficiency and uptake for him. So you might like to watch this in the chat pane, the video of Harry, or you might want to watch it through the video tool. Okay, so I hope you found that useful. Um, so just really now to um, finish up, I'd just like to summarise um, what we've tried to do in this session. We've tried to uh, raise your awareness of what flipped learning is and how it can be used um, to maximise um, active learning opportunities and engagement with learners and hopefully help them to become more independent learners and maybe develop employability skills as well in that context. And we've shown you uh, a range of tools or ideas that you can use so that whatever your uh, skill level, um, you can actually go in at some level and have a little play. And there's lots of examples in the files that we've transferred with you uh, over to you at the beginning of the session that you can maybe explore at your leisure. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so yes, Ginny, you do need a plan B. Excuse me, <coughs> frogging my throat there. You do need a plan B, but it's all about that culture shift and <coughs> changing learner expectation from the beginning of what you expect if they're coming on that course. <coughs> that there is an understanding that they will engage with learning materials prior to coming to activities. <coughs> and as Jake said, you can actually um, use the resources and access them online on the learners uh, smartphones on their own devices in the lesson to start with to encourage them to to engage so it might take a, a couple of sessions before they realize that they're going to not be able to partic participate in activities but uh, hopefully the message will eventually get through absolutely Steve the worst thing you can do is create a resource that lasts an hour I would definitely agree with that um, Yes, it is difficult if you've only got a one shot at a class. I appreciate that. So it's about choosing your opportunities to try these things out, trying them with learners um, that you think you might have some some chance of success with. <coughs> yes, it, it is more of a blended learning approach, I think, Philip, and we don't really want um, learners to 
be engaging uh, with passive content and lots of it outside of the classroom. And all of our learning in the classroom has to be active learning. It's about choosing the right tools and having a mix and match and a blend of tools. Some comments there from Angela. That's an interesting strategy at uh, university. A lot of universities are using this flipped learning approach, actually, yeah. That's interesting, Angela, yes. So it only takes a few sessions of not being able to participate because you haven't prepared beforehand, and you soon get the message that you need to access the resources that you've been directed to before you go to the session. <coughs> Some interesting comments there. Well, I hope we've given you lots of food for thought today. And what I'd like to do now, um, just to finish up, is to direct you to um, a few more uh, webinars that we've got coming up over the next coming days that you might be interested in. Um, to find out more about these and to book, then there's a link um, at the bottom of your screen there bit.ly slash rsc forward slash insight or go to our website. Thank you, Steve, for pasting it in the page. And also, we're following this up with next week after the web webinars, opportunities for face-to-face -face workshop day, either at Leicester University or at Nottingham. So again, if you're interested in finding out what those uh, workshops are, and many of them will follow on from um, the webinars that we've done this week, um, then go to the link there. And all of our resources from the webinars and from the face-to-face -face workshop will be eventually hosted on our East Midlands Moodle. So if you give us a couple of days, and then you can start looking to see those resources. And we will refer you to um, other um, resources, particularly on flipped learning, because we've done training events on that. There's lots of resources we can refer you to additionally in there. Just a reminder about what the GISC Regional Support Centres do, supporting learning providers throughout the UK, helping you to improve your performance, effectiveness, efficiency, not only in teaching and learning context, but also in a business context as well by using technology. And as you sign up from here, you will be presented with a uh, feedback questionnaire, which we'd appreciate it if you would uh, fill that in, please. Um, there's my contact details, and we'd, I'd like to um, also thank my co-presenter, Jake Dartington from Bilba College, who's been sharing his um, first steps with flipped learning. So thank you very much, Jake, for, for showing us what you did. Good. Um, thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it, actually. This is a, another way to teach again, isn't it, these webinars? So it's been great to be involved. OK, thank you ever so much for that. And thank you also to Steve and Phil, who've been in the background sorting out technical issues and posting things like Fury in the chat pane as well. Uh, so thank you all for participating today. It's great to see so many of you here. And hopefully it's given you food for thought, and you'll be thinking about flipping all sorts of things in the future. So thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>